last Sunday, <clears throat> I was going to preach on uh, this scripture that I'm going to use today. Um, so if you have your Bibles, open them to uh, Luke chapter 20 and also to Isaiah chapter 5. And I decided that uh, last Sunday I was just going to, uh, last Sunday was a very hard sermon for me, I don't know why, um, uh, just a, a difficult or a different, I won't say difficult, a different service, and um, so I didn't know if maybe I should not have changed my message, but I'm going to preach that message today because I want to preach the full countenance of God's Word. I don't want to just cherry pick the sermons that I like or that feel comfortable to me. I want to preach God's Word all the way through. And as a matter of fact, um, this particular re week I was reading the book of Ezekiel. And I was overwhelmed by this one line. Uh, of all the times I've read Ezekiel, uh, it probably did not, this one line that is reoccurring in al almost every chapter in the book, uh, 47 chapters, I believe. But some chapters had it two times, three times, four times, one chapter, five times, this particular phrase, and that they may know the Lord God, and that they may know, that they may know the Lord God, said in different ways, but over and over and over and over again. So I want to preach that today, but before I do, talk about God and his timing. I want to give you the, the words to a song. I had them here on my phone. I never bring my phone into to, to worship service. Um, but it, there's, there's a group that wrote this song. Uh, they're probably most famous for writing the song, I Can Only Imagine. Um, they got a lot of notoriety. Matter of fact, there's a, a movie that's come out about them writing um, that song, I Can Only Imagine, and the, um, the lead singer, his relationship with his earthly father. But as many groups that are that famous now, they tour a lot. And when they do, they get up in front of large audiences. And sometimes there's a tendency to want to perform. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Now, the outside world can do that. But when you're in God's ministry, God forbid that we ever perform. I never want to get up in front of a group and try to put on a performance. Um, I've had people ask me if they, to do, you know, 10 minutes of comedy to make everybody laugh before it. I never want to do that. Number one, I'm not that funny. But, but number two... I never want to take away from what God does. And I say all the time, all is vanity if God doesn't speak. Are y'all good with that? All is vanity. And they wrote this song, and I want to read you to the, the lyrics to this song, and then we'll stand in honor of reading God's Word. I'm finding myself at a loss for words. And the funny thing is, it's okay. The last thing I need is to be heard. And I feel that so much today. But to hear what you say, word of God speak. John 1 says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Word of God speak. Would you pour down like rain? Washing my eyes to see your majesty. To be still and know that you're in this place. Please let me stay and rest in your holiness. Word of God speak. I'm finding myself in the midst of you. Beyond the music and beyond the noise. All that I need is to be with you. And in the quiet, hear your voice. Word of God speak. That's my prayer today. Would you stand with me in honor of reading God's word? 
We're going to look in Luke. I will not read uh, Isaiah's passage until after our prayer. But in Luke chapter 20 and verse number 9, Jesus began to tell the people this parable. A certain man planted a vineyard, leased it to vine dressers, and went into a far country for a long time. Now at vintage time, the right time, God's time, he sent a servant to the vine dressers that they might give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the vine dressers beat him and sent him away empty handed. Again, he sent another servant, and they beat him also, treated him shamefully, and sent him away empty handed. And again, he sent a third. They wounded him also and cast him out. Verse 13, then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Probably, that probably they will respect him when they see him. But when the vine dressers saw him, they reasoned among themselves saying, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, that the inheritance may be ours. So they cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those vine dressers and give the vineyard to others. Praise God that he didn't just leave it there, but he gave the vineyard. To others, where I can personally say, because of that, I had an opportunity as well. And when they heard it, that is the group listening, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they said, certainly not. I believe what they were saying, certainly not, was that he would come and give it to others. Then he looked at them and said, what then is this that is written? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Whoever falls on that stone will be broken. Humility. But on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. Listen to verse 19 very carefully. And the chief priest and the scribes that very hour sought to lay hands on him, but they feared the people, for they knew he had spoken this parable against them. They knew. They knew. And they knew the intent of their heart, that they were far from God, but it did not matter to them. All they wanted to do at that point in time is to continue a lifestyle that blessed them, not blessed God. It was what they wanted, not what God's wanted. Their pride was lifted up rather than being humble and falling before the living truth. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, this is your word. You are the author. And Lord, all is vain if you don't come and speak it to our hearts. So I pray today that the preaching of your word will be plain. Holy Spirit, we will, may you amen it into our hearts. That we would hear exactly what it is that you have to say. And sir, may you be honored and glorified. Father, may we see your nature of good, of love, and may we be drawn to that. And Lord, give us godly repentance today of everything in our lives that does not honor you. Everything in our life that does not honor you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You can be seated and Put your finger in Luke 20. We'll come back there. But let's look in Isaiah, that great author, the prophet of God, who God used in such a mighty way. I love the book of Isaiah. It's full of so much truth. Matter of fact, Isaiah 6 is one of my favorite chapters because Isaiah, at a very difficult time in his life, when his hero, when his king Uzziah had died, and he really didn't know what to do, 
and God gave him an opportunity to draw him close, and he was actually in Isaiah 6, brought into the very presence of a holy God. But in Isaiah 5, we hear a word that God shared of a vineyard. And this vineyard is him speaking of his people that he loves so very much and so well, the people of Israel, God's anointed people. God said that he would make a peculiar, a strange, but, but yet his own special people. It was promised to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And the, the, the sons of Israel, as they were taken into Egypt in the 400 years later, God held them together and brought them out, delivered them to bring them finally to the promised land. And you think that at that point in time, after suffering 400 years in slavery, that they would have been, been eager to follow the Lord God, but they were prone to wander. They really wanted to worship what they had known in the past. God forbid we ever bow a knee to the God of the past. We only can meet God in the right now. We can only meet God in present tense. One day, we'll step out of time and we'll step into eternity. But right now, I can't change yesterday and I can't do anything tomorrow except by the decisions that I make in the right now. God is here listening to us. God is in this room with us wanting to do a work in the right now. But their lifestyle went away. So Ezekiel would say that all the things of the captivity of the children of Israel that they were led into, all those things were so that they would know that the Lord was the Lord God. We've got to make up our mind. You see the Lord God in our life. In Isaiah 5, he tells the story of a vineyard. Listen to it very plainly. Now let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. This is of God, his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up, cleared out its stones. If you've ever seen the land of that time, it's full of stones everywhere. That's why they had all the rock walls, right? Had to have a place of putting those stones, put them to use. He dug it up, cleared out its stones, planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst, also made a wine press in it. You're going to plant a great vineyard. You're going to have to have a wine press, those two rocks where the, it could be pressed down, it could be the one rock would come down and crush the grapes, the, the fruit of the grape would come forward. It says in verse 2, he expected it to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth buushin, wild grapes, sour berries. You can taste it right now. Have you ever had that you put it in its mouth and it would set your teeth on edge? You had the expectation of it being one thing, but it became something totally different. Sour grapes, sour berries, rotten fruit, deceptive. He planted it with the choicest of vines that it would bring forth fruit. John 15 talks about the vine. We are the branches grafted into the vine. Our Father is the vine dresser, the gardener. And he wants fruit. Matter of fact, John 15 says fruit, more fruit, much fruit, fruit that remains. That's what God wants in the Christian life. We are alive to produce fruit for the glory of God. And God will, because he loves us, he will prune us. Because we need to be not about us, the great, big, long, fruitful vine. But you know, every vine that's fruitful, the sap goes forward through it, not for the vine's sake, not for the branch's sake, but for the fruit that hangs on those branches. And that's all we are, are tools that God can hang his fruit on. So he prunes us that we will not just produce fruit, but more fruit, much fruit, fruit that remains. We become strong and healthy. That's what he did for his vineyard. He expected good to come from it. But what came? Bu'ushin. Sour berries. Listen to verse 3. Now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and the men of Judah, judge please between me and my vineyard. Look at what I am. Look at what I've done. Look at what I've provided. 
and look at the fruit that's come between it. He says very plainly, what more could I have, I have, what more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Did I do anything wrong? Have I come up short? Have I not done everything as God for my people? Have I not provided for them? Have I not been there? Have, am I not Emmanuel well? Living in their hearts. What more could have been done? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth sour berries, wild grapes? Verse 5. Now please, let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. This is prophetic words of the nature of God. May we listen and hear. I will take away its hedge, its protection. It shall be burned. I will break down its walls. It shall be trampled down. I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned or dug, but there shall come up briars and thorns. Can you just stop right now and see it as the, the, the gardener, the husbandman, planted it, did all these things, dug it up so wonderfully well, no, I mean, no, no self uh, no self-deserving weed would ever want to grow there quickly plucked up, just absolutely beautiful, absolutely in order. But yet, because of the false fruit, let those words, by the power of the Holy Spirit, come deep within us. May we never have fruit that we think or we want others to see it as being beautiful when God looks at it and says, nothing. Yet, now look at the vineyard, as beautiful as it was, as attractive as it was. Now it's, the hedge has been burned. The rock walls torn down. The wine press unused. Vacant. Weeds growing. Have y'all ever been down a road where, let's say that there was a, some of you know a house maybe that was built in the 50s or 60s, or dare say the 70s, that, that when it was built, it was the absolute most beautiful thing, and everybody said that is the absolute, it's wonderful, that's the house I would dream, my dream house. But then later, it's run down. Broken windows. Rotted wood. In shambles. Listen to me, church. May that never be the description of God's people. It will lay, I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned or dug, but there shall, be, there shall come up briars and thorns, and I will command the clouds no rain on it. Barren, dry, fruitless. Verse 7. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. The men of Judah are his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, but behold, oppression. For righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. Woe. Verse 8. When I think of woe, the first thing I want to say, you know, y'all, I'm sorry, but I, I got to be honest. I, I think of John Wayne saying, woe, right, to the horse. But really it means terrible things to you. It's a big stop sign saying, stop, don't continue down this road. Bridge out ahead. If you continue down this road, there will be danger. There will be hardship. There will be death. How many signs does God have to put up in front of us before we ever heed the sign and heed the warning? I, I'm sorry I'm not trying to be strong, but you understand this is the Word of God. This is the God who is loving and kind, who sits on the throne in heaven, who is saying, what more could I have done? But they're walking away from the fruitful path, and they've chosen a different path. Where's the repentance? 
Woe to those who join house to house. They add field to field till there is no place where they may dwell alone in the midst of the land. Verse 8, materialism. They build and build and have and have, and it's never enough. Does that not sound familiar? A people that is never satisfied, that is looking for materialism? In the hearing of the Lord, the, uh, the, in, in my hearing, the Lord of hosts said, Truly many houses shall be desolate, great and beautiful ones, without inhabitation. How devastatingly sad. Verse 10. Ten acres of vineyards shall yield one bath. A homer of seed shall yield one ether. Literally, it should produce a thousand times this. But a vineyard with so much possibilities. My people that I want to bless so very much yields so little. Verse 11, woe to those who rise early in the morning to the, that they may drink or they may follow intoxicating drink. Will continue until night till wine inflames them. Seems like a society that only won't spun. The promise of alcohol and drugs. There's an epidemic in America. An epidemic that has a bottomless pit of death. The harp and the strings, the tambourine and the flute, the wine are in their feast, but they do not regard the work of the Lord, nor consider the operation of his hands. They're just looking for a good time and a party. Does that not sound like America? Verse 13, therefore my people have gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. This scares me. Their honorable men are famished. Their multitude dried up with thirst. Therefore, Sheol, the grave, has enlarged itself, opened its mouth beyond measure, their glory and their multitude and their pomp. And he who is jubilant shall descend into it. They think, America today thinks that they've, they've, get, they've got the, the brass ring, they think they've got all the answers and they're running toward it, but it's simply taking them to the grave. In, dis, in despair. Their multitude, it says in verse 14, their glory and their multitude and their pomp. And he who is jubilant shall descend into it. Speaking of the grave. What will the story of America be? What will the story of our culture be? What will the story of the richest nation in the world be? My prayer is that our testimony will not be dried up devastation, a, a vapor gone, dust in the wind. We sing the song, and I'm grateful for it. God bless America. And he has. But listen, God does not bless sin. And if we God's people, let's not talk about them out there. If we God's people do not bow the knee, but if we follow after the American dream and after the fruitfulness of this world and we just gather in with them, we're going to go into the ditch with them. We're going to go into the grave with them. May that never be said of God's people. Verse 15, people shall be brought down. Each man do, shall be humbled. I pray that. The eyes of the lofty shall be humble, but the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment, and God who is holy shall be hallowed in righteousness. Then the lambs shall feed in their pasture, and in the waste places of the fat ones strangers may eat. I, I know I've got to hurry, so let me just go quickly in verse 18. Woe to those who draw iniquity with cords of vanity and sin as if with a cart rope. He, he's talking about drawing iniquity with cords of vanity. It's almost like he's talking, y'all know what I'm talking about when I say a parade? A, a float in a parade and they dress it up so that everybody could see it. 
really, that's really what he's talking about here. It's almost like a float in the parade, but what is it that they're showing off? Their iniquity. Where's the shame? We always said nightclubs were, night clubs were dark because it's easier to sin in the dark. But now, that which was hidden is actually being exalted by our culture today. Things that uh, my generation would look at and say, I would never. My dad's generation would look at my generation today and would say, where's your shame? Verse 19, they, that say, let him make, his, make speed and hasten his work that we may see it. And let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw near and come that we may know it. Scoffers. People scoffing at God. And I hate to hear all the people of the world that are scoffing at our holy God. But you know, it's just as bad when God's people who are called by His name do not follow His word. Come on now. And who say that they believe God is a God, a great God who can do great things, but they don't believe that God can do it there. May the testimony of New Holland believe that we believe God can do great and mighty things, and we believe God can do great and mighty things here. And we believe God can do great and mighty things in us. If not, we've joined the scoffers. Verse 20, woe to those who call evil good and good evil who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. If I've ever heard this in this generation today, they say, well, everything's relative. No, it's not. Well, it just depends. No, it doesn't. Truth is truth. If I go up, I'm coming down. That's the law of gravity. Amen? I can do that all day. I promise you I'm going to come down every time. God's word, God's laws, the essence of who he is, that doesn't change. It does not change. You change the truth. You don't expect truth to change to you. And if you look at it, and this is the word of the day in America, well, everybody's got to find their own way. Everybody's got to find their own truth. And, and what's good for you, let it be good for you, but I, I'll choose my own way. That's a highway to hell. And it's a broad way, and many there will be who go thereby. Be careful when people say, well, everything's relative. It makes my skin crawl. Verse 21, woe to those who are wise in their own eyes, prudent in their own sight. That's pride. Do we have a problem with pride today? I hate 2020 for one reason. It's a political year. And we're going to get bombarded, bombarded with pride. I don't care what side of the jungle you're on. It's still a jungle. Amen? Instead of holy people falling down before a holy God, it's defending what they think in their way and what they think means more important than anything else. And the American people are going to pay for it. Oh, I can go on and on and on. I'm trying to be mindful of your time. Go back to Luke. He planted a vineyard. He leased it out. He gave them an opportunity. He went into a far country for a long time. It's been a long time, hadn't it? We were kidding about this morning. Matter of fact, just about every week we kid about it. You know, today would be a good day for the Lord to come. Today would be a good day to leave a world of sin behind. Heartache and pain. Anybody up for no more sickness? No more heartache? Anybody up for a place where only love reigns? Satan always attacks relationships. Anybody up for going to a place where everyone loves everyone perfectly? Sound pretty good, doesn't it? Well, it's not going to happen here. And I know it's been a long time, but my Lord made a promise. My Lord said he'd come and get us. My Lord said he'd come and he'd take us home. 
He said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Are y'all good with come again? And receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. That means I get to go to heaven. I praise God for the promises. But he left the vineyard. A vineyard that was supposed to produce fruit of his glory. A vineyard that was supposed to produce fruit of his son. Jesus high and lifted up. Jesus, the one who humbled himself on our account. We should give him all glory in everything. We should spend every day seeking to pray and, and humble ourselves before him and seek his word so that his word can seek us. Word of God, speak. Would you fall down like rain? We need to be people with eyes to love people the way he loves people. We need to be people that are about his business, giving a cup of cold water in Jesus' name, giving out of our resources that we have so very much to someone else so that they can know Christ. We must get off of our high horse and our pride, and we must, get, we must humble ourselves and share, lovingly share, get down on our knees if we have to. That's what Christ did so that someone else can know the glory of God. Don't care what they think about you, but care what you think about God. Share with others the love of Christ. We are to be about the Lord's business. Verse 10, at harvest time he sent a servant to the vine dressers that they might give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. Does he not deserve fruit? Oh, but they beat him, treated him bad. He sent another treated him worse, sent a third with no care except for their own. They did not honor the servants of God. So he said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I will send my beloved son who never did anything for himself. He did not come to be served, but he came to serve. He was not trying to raise a kingdom on earth. He was trying to tell somebody, like John the Baptist said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And it comes in a relationship with Jesus Christ. But they did not want to repent of their ways. They did not want to, to, to say, I've got to change. So they took him. Verse 15, they cast him out of the vineyard up onto a hill called Calvary. And they killed him. So what will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy those vine dressers and give the vineyard away to others. In A.D. 70, Rome came in and Jerusalem was destroyed, burned temple has not been built back. Pastor, do you believe it's last days? I do. I do believe it's last days. God allowed Israel to come together again. What, 70 years ago? They came together. They've tried everything in the world to kill them. Our own government's trying to get them to give their land back. I will tell you, if America ever gets on the wrong side of Israel, America is doomed. God is at work. We are in end times. It's not a matter of, is Christ coming? It's a matter, are we going to be ready when he comes? The people who should have been the, who, who God gave the hand of blessing said, no, certainly not. It won't be taken from us. New Holland, if we're not about God's business, God will take the anointing away from us and give it to somebody else. This is a sermon on repentance. And the invitation must be given by the Holy Spirit there's an area in your life that God has been working with you on, listen, I understand the end of the sermon is coming, but I can tell by your body language that you're shutting down. 
Please don't do that. If you think this is a message for somebody else, you need to go to Luke 18 and read of the two people who went and prayed. One a, one a, Fer, one a Pharisee and one a publican. On that particular cage, I'd rather be like the publican. By the way, I didn't say Republican. The tax collector. Because the religious person, God said he would just push him away. See, the problem with America is we got it. We got it. And we are very comfortable with our form of godliness. All I ask of you, all I ask is to listen to Jesus Christ, listen to his word, listen to, if you're a, if you're a Christian, listen to the Holy Spirit in your heart and act accordingly. He will begin telling you some things that you need to change. I don't care who you are in this room. Every one of us need change. Chief. Paul said he was chief among sinners. I'm probably chief of sinners here. I'm not going to compare mine to yours or yours to mine, but I am going to be accountable to him for them. The gospel is a half gospel. The gospel is a half gospel. If all I'm telling you about is the love of God, and all you've got to do is just check in and say, Lord, I believe, and I'm going to go do my own thing. I don't think that's the gospel. The gospel is what Jesus did for you on the cross of Calvary, and you must believe in that. You must choose that. But listen to me. You must live a life of daily repentance. Because we're daily sinners. And I understand that when he forgave me of my sins, he forgave me of all my sins. I'm not preaching that you'll lose your salvation. Don't get me wrong. But I am telling you that daily he is looking for us in a relationship with him. The problem with the church today is we're waiting for everybody else to get straightened out in their walk with God. But today, God's business needs to begin here. Today, God's business needs to begin in our hearts. And I truly wonder, will we embrace the message of repentance or will the vineyard be torn down and given to another? Isaiah 5 is not me. That's him. Luke 20 is not me. It's him. But as Isaiah, the prophet, spoke it loud and clear, I did my very best today to do the same. As Luke brings us these, these encouraging words from Christ himself, hear the heart of Christ. Church, we do not need to play games. We are the living embodiment of Christ in this world. We need to be about his business. Anything in our life that is not honoring him needs to be gone. It needs to be repented of, and it needs to be gone. I can tell you of days and the days of past when tears filled the church. Today I see much more laughter, and that may be my fault, than there are tears. And I am fine with laughter if the laughter honors God. Amen? But I'm also very fine with tears if they honor God. Whatever it is that we need today, let's do it unto him. I give this last word to you. In the next few moments when you talk to God, bear this in mind. Are you doing it with all your heart, your soul, and your mind, and your strength? And are you doing it with a heart that sees others the way you want to be seen, that treats others the way you want to be treated? Let's pray. Father, all is vain. If you do not speak, the only thing that adds life is the power of your word, the Holy Spirit. There are many things in this world that we say are good, and Lord, I say that they are good, but Lord, I know the 
There's a difference between good and better and between better and best. And Jesus, your word is the only thing that produces fruit in our life that lasts forever. So Father, I pray that in this building, you would begin a work. May the encouragement, and I pray that it is a word of encouragement. May it come from the Holy Spirit that would call us from our sins unto you, a holy God. Father, how long has it been since we've been broken because of our sin? Father, may there be a call by the power of the Holy Spirit that will knock us to our knees once again. If there's anyone here that does not know you as Savior and Lord, may they believe and may they trust and Lord, may they repent and give their heart and life to you. Lord, I know that there are many who have professed Christ but are walking a guilty distance. Call them home. This invitation is yours, O oh Lord. I would not dare try to give it. They don't need to hear a word from me, but they desperately need to hear from you. Speak as only you can. And sir, we'll give you all the honor and the glory and the praise. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.